everybody. Welcome to Ozark Natural Science Center's virtual program. Today we're welcoming Bo Brown as he reads parts of his Foraging the Ozarks, a new book. And we'll post information where you can look up the book and where you can support, support Ozark Natural Science Center by becoming a member, or you can support students, or you can give us a one-time donation, whatever might work for you. Learn more about our, our other virtual programs on our website, onsc.us. And without further ado, I will hand you over to Bo. Welcome, Bo. Hello. That's our fancy camera work right there. That is. That's flawless. You should be in Hollywood. We gather around, kids. It's Grandpa Bo in the rocking chair, getting ready to read from the book. Uh, we're out here at Ozark Natural Sciences Center. My new book, Forging the Ozark, just came out on the 15th. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, just a bit about this place. I have a long-term connection with this because I've, I've been in the biological sciences for a long time and uh, just an unavowed nature geek. So uh, when this place first opened, I applied for a job here. And uh, I was doing uh, songbird research at the time. so. Uh, there was other other better paying jobs to be had out around in the country, so I ended up not working here. But over the course of time, uh, my other love is Stone Age wilderness survival skills. I run a school called Stone Age, uh, called uh, First Church Wilderness School, and we teach all the survival skills uh, that are of our ancestors: stone tool making, weaponry, you know, all of it. And so uh, our friend Larry Buell was on the staff out here for a long time. He helped us start a, uh, a uh, gathering that happens the last full weekend of September. Uh, it's called the Bodark Skills Camp and Nap-In. It was a big part of that for about our first seven or eight years or so. Uh, we sadly had to cancel that event this year because of you know what. So anyway, uh, that and my dear mentor and the guy responsible for my entire nature and science career into birds and then later on other stuff, was Dr. Kimberly Smith, and he was on the board out here for some time, and in fact, he is in my book, and I'm going to read you the, uh, the passage from that. Uh, uh, Dr. Jane Fitzgerald, who was actually studying at the time for her PhD, uh, they, the university had put together this three-year-long uh, periodical cicada study, studying the relationship between birds and uh, all the other uh, plant and in interactions with the periodical cicada. That would be 13 years cicada. And uh, so anyway, he hired me on my first job doing uh, banding and bird research. He got me my second job at Point Reyes Bird Observatory on the California coast. And later on, uh, just hooked me up with bunches of jobs at Bear Study in the, in the Washita's uh, uh, Point Reyes Bird, bird Observatory. He got me out into some of the coastal islands off California. And so I owe him a big debt of gratitude for all the things he did for getting me started on this business. And I got to go down and visit the little uh, memorial bench. There's a sweet little memorial bench in his honor here. Uh, my passage in the book is Dr. Kim Smith and Dr. Jane Fitzgerald. Thanks for hiring this unschooled and unqualified but highly enthusiastic nature geek in 1985 for my first songbird research job, an adventure that continues today. That work provided an opportunity to learn volumes of people who knew far more than I ever would about the natural sciences. Thank you. So uh, we did a little plant walk uh, earlier and covered a few plants. Um, one of the ones I was hoping to find that I did not is the pawpaw, and that's uh, they're going to be ripening up real soon. So this is this is quite timely. Uh, I'll just read a little bit from it. Uh, a lot of the book, before I go any further, a lot of the book is written in field guide style. So it's long, boring kind of botanical descriptions of exactly, I wanted you to know exactly what the plant was, so I included lengthy descriptions. And then the uses are just, you know, it's not, it's not a tent, Tom Clancy not a thing. So, but I did include a few stories, and if, you, if I had a connection with that plant or something, I'd, I'd include. So I'll read a few of those. Uh, this one, the little forefront for that uh, entry on pawpaw is Many in the rural Ozarks are familiar with our native Missouri banana. 
This tropical looking native bears the largest fruit indigenous to North America. It has sweet custard like flesh with a flavor somewhere between a banana, mango, and papaya. If not for its short shelf life, pawpaw might be on store shelves as our most popular native fruit. And if you've ever tasted that thing, there's a picture of it. It is heaven. And there's a, there's a few recipes in here, and actually I'll read the one uh, associated with this. Uh, I came across this by accident where I teach my classes. Um, it's about an hour north of Springfield, Missouri. <clears throat> I had 10 acres in the middle of an 8,000 acre state forest called Leadmine Conservation Area. And it's right on the Nine River. And so I was up there one time when the pawpaws arrived. There was a little Mennonite store down the road, so I thought, well, I'm gonna make me some pawpaw pancakes. And so I get up there and got some pancake mix and he's gonna buy some syrup while well, they didn't have any. But they had brown sugar. So I took the pawpaws and mixed them in the, uh, just like making banana pancakes. You just put some of the pulp and the banana into your uh, pancake mix. And for the syrup, I took the brown sugar and melted it down, uh, you know, so like uh, half and half sugar and half water, and uh, then put seasonings in it. So I knew where there was a patch of wild ginger and the spice bush berries were on. So I added both of those things to the, uh, to the syrup and come up with the most incredible tasting syrup I think I've ever had. So I'll read you the recipe for pop pop pancakes with wild ginger and spice bush berry butter syrup. It's a mouthful. Use your favorite pancake recipe and add half a cup or so of diced pop pop flesh. Syrup is two cups of brown sugar, one cup water, one half cup butter, one tablespoon each of dried spice bush berries and wild ginger roots. Bring to a boil and simmer that is up to the desired thickness. This is good syrup. Pour through a strainer. Use the leftover roots to make crystallized wild ginger snack as described in that plant segment. So, uh, there's the, the wild ginger we mentioned. So. And hopefully you all will get to see what these plants look like whenever you buy the book. Um, I'm going to move forward here. There's a few little humorous uh, stories that came about whenever I uh, was um, collecting things for this book. And one of them was with a plant known as Jerusalem artichoke. And uh, if any of you know that plant, it's a pretty sunflower looking thing. It's got an edible tuber. And the tuber is exceptional and kind of known for this one thing. Uh, the reading is. Uh, during a wilderness skills class, my assistant decided to include the starchy tubers of a newly discovered patch of Jews on artichoke and mail it every meal we ate. Their high inulin content must have fueled epic gas production because that night we reenacted the campfire scene in the film Blazing Saddles. They are called fartichokes for good reason. And that's how they're going to refer to as that. So uh, it's uh, there. I do include some uh, tips to reduce that effect. But the. Uh, the last entry in the warnings and comments was uh, uh, overconsumption can occasionally cause stomach distress but normally results in nothing more than extreme flatulence. It's a plant that can provide both food and campfire entertainments. <laughs> it's uh, you can have fun with this stuff. Um, let's move on to watercress. That's a very familiar plant. Uh, it's one of the things I grew up uh, grew up with. My mom was quite fond of her boiled greens and her spring watercress greens and every plant or every uh, fruit and nut in season that she had as kids out gathering. We'd sit around the, the radio because we didn't have TV one of those name and pick walnuts out of their shells for that was our entertainment on the evening. So uh, on the entry on watercress, I'd tell you a story about that. Watercress was my mom's favorite wild salad green. We gathered at the nearby Okino Berry Farm, which still grows abundantly near the springhouse milk pool with the spring source of the The water was surely contaminated with E. coli from the large pasture atop the hill and occasionally cows that got into the spring, but we never had problems. Maybe the watercress was decontaminated by the hot bacon grease and vinegar she always put on, put on it, or maybe because our 50 foot deep well never passed the water test and we were just used to it. I remember every time it rained, our well would muddy up, and 
my dad pulled the uh, pulled the wellhead out one time because it had gotten fogged up with mud, and it was these tiny little white crayfish stuck on it. So that was a part of a cave system. That's how that's how he doused to find that well. He used the old peach peach fork and told the guy where to put it. The neighbor across the street, they were drilling their, their well about the same time. They had to go near to 300 feet to get water, and we got it at 50. <laughs> so apparently dowsing works if you know how to do it. Let's uh, move on a little bit here. Let's talk a little bit about the cover. If you notice the cover over here, that's a uh, very unusual looking plant. The ground plum. If you can see the cover of the, the book over here, uh, that is in the pea family. And the first time I encountered that plant was uh, up on my property. There's a big steep hill with a road going up, up it, and it was open enough that it kind of mimicked a glade or prairie. So there's Leacris and uh, some of the other uh, glade and prairie plants you'd expect to see. And I happened to go up, walk up there one you know, early, early summer, something like that. Saw these beautiful little round fruits that were plum colored, and I, I had no idea what they were. I've never seen it in a book, or I've never seen one in a foraging book. So I picked one, took a little nibble of it, which is not always the safest thing to do because some plants contain raphides, which are little uh, uh, cal calcium calcium. What is it? Uh, anyway, they're little crystals. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that name. Uh, and anyway, they will embed themselves in your flesh. So you want to not do that unless you know the plant. But I did this anyway. It was early in my, my experience of getting into plants. And it was like a sweet uh, snow pea, except crunchier and wetter. And it was just like the most delicious thing I'd ever put in my mouth. And so that kind of hooked me. And, and come to find out, they they do grow in the Ozarks. They're more of a prairie plant. You get into a lot more common when you get kind of the western side of Missouri, out of the Ozarks into the prairies. Uh, but the, the big open bluff tops, if you walk out when it's an open area just right above a bluff, that's where you'll see them, and you'll see them along the open areas, along uh, along roadsides, along paths and things like that. They, uh, they they like a little bit of open, but they, they can make it sometimes in a, with a little bit of shade. So read a little bit about that one. In fact, it was the story I just told. My first encounter with ground, pl ground plum was in an opening on a steep wooded hillside at my top along the Niambi River, where the ripe plum colored pods caught my eye. I was eager for taste of seeing the field guy was amazed at the sweet, snow pea flavored succulent crunch. Been a big fan of ever since. Now, that family is uh, one that, well, there's another plant out west out there that the foliage looks very similar, and it's called loco. And it's, uh, it does call something called locoism, which is makes cows and livestock go kind of nuts, <laughs> get aggressive or goofy or one thing or another. So they, uh, uh, but none of the fruits of the rest of those have, uh, are round like that or have, have crunchy centers like that. Let's go over to Smilax. Um, if you guys know Smilax, it's uh, also known as Greenbrier, Catbrier, a bunch of other names. Uh, and the, I had an encounter with that thing uh, while doing bird research work down in southern Missouri where I was trying to stomp over a lot of it and it got tangled up and fell in it and got very tangled. So I'll read that, that story. <clears throat> Hiking off trail in the Ozarks can be hazardous. Years ago, during songbird, songbird research field work, I got tangled and fell while attempting to walk across the top of a three-foot-high thicket of greenbrier, and it took a while to extricate myself. My skin was so scratched and bloody that while walking the road out, someone in the car slowed to a stop by me, saw my bloody neck and shirt, and then sped off. I think they thought I was somebody tried to murder me or something. They didn't want any part of it. A friend later saw my scratches and asked if I'd been wrestling bobcats. Falling into a green bar, green bar thicket can definitely evoke some bad language, thus the nickname blaspheme vine. At least the plant has redeeming values. The young shoots are delicious. And uh, if you find that plant growing in the early spring, the shoots will get pretty, pretty large diameter. And it's like asparagus. You find out where it'll snap easy, 
and uh, you know go down the tough part of it until it snaps off easy like you're cleaning up your asparagus stems and that tender top does taste somewhat like asparagus very nutritious and uh, and the root also is uh, the smaller younger rootlets are, are edible they will get to the roots will grow as big as your head but, uh, in this ground you'd have to have a back of it to get it out <laughs> so I've never dug one of the big roots but I've, I've tried some of the little small ones and they're, they're pretty tasty going to possibly read uh, a lengthy bit about uh, uh, one of the appendix that I put in here. I've recently started doing a talk about, uh, in the past five years or so, about uh, all of the things that we've lost in our food supply, the, the, the things you buy at the store. Ozark Folk Center down in Mount View, Arkansas. Uh, I've been doing programs out there. And before I started doing that program, I had only done plant walks. I'd never sat in the room and talked about a plant or plants in front of a room full of people and having to be a PowerPoint or something like that. So uh, they do a two day herb walking seminar every spring down there. So uh, I had to come up with something to talk about. And I just, I had no idea because everybody else said we were pretty high-end herbalists, and they all had their plan or their preparation or something they were going to talk about. So uh, I decided to, because I've been reading about how much uh, um, how much more nutrient-dense and vitamin-rich wild plants were than, than uh, domesticated plants. So I come, I come up with a title. I was going to call it uh, Wild Food or Industrial Food versus Wild Food, and just started looking into all of the the things that are in undomesticated plants that we've pretty much bred out of. And uh, so I, I will read from that. It's pretty lengthy and it's got a lot of big words. So <laughs> I tried to include a lot on this. <clears throat> this is uh, Appendix D, Industrial Food vs. Coffee. The plants we buy at the supermarket, supermarket might look and taste great, that humans apparently have been selecting away from the medicine in our plant foods for more than 10,000 years. Yeah. When we transitioned from our hunter-gatherer past to an agrarian lifestyle, we selected a few plant varieties that were larger, sweeter, easier to grow, and easier to process than their wild counterparts. This resulted in our consumption of a much smaller variety of plants than had been uh, relied on earlier, especially bitter herbs, tough roots, and plants that required a high level of processing. Studies show that many of these undomesticated plants contain high levels of anthocyanins, polyphenols, and other phytonutrients that are essential to good health. Modern commercially grown food contains more sugar and water and fewer vitamins, minerals, and nutrients in comparison. Recent archaeological studies of cultures in the areas of transition confirm that early Neolithic herder farmers lost bone density, developed cavities, were more susceptible to disease, and even grew physically shorter when compared to those down employing a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. A stable but less diverse food supply was apparently less beneficial to health than an intermittent but extremely varied food base. The combination of large-scale livestock meat production and mechanized agriculture that allowed for higher yields uh, worked together to reverse some of those early negative health trends that may have created new ones in the process. Much of our current agricultural system is primarily concentrated on cultivating monocrops for the ease of mass production, uniformity, marketability, and long shelf life. However, many aspects of modern food production can deteriorate nutritional quality in many ways. Croplands can become exhaustive of natural minerals and nutrients requiring heavy use of fossil fuel derived fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. Factor in the long harvest to table time and shipped foods loss of species variety due to monocropping and the lack of genetic diversity in individual plants, the reliance on grain-based and high sugar foods, and yet unknown possible long-term health and environmental impacts from high-tech genetic tampering. Taken together, these developments have produced a food source that is not as beneficial to health as it could be and may be contributing to common health problems today such as, as diabetes and obesity. 
in areas without available foraging opportunities or an abundance of wild lands, there are still great alternatives to industrial food. These include small farm agritourism, urban farmers markets, and farm-to-table dining opportunities that offer organic, heirloom plant varieties, and wider selections that can be found in most supermarkets. So. Okay. Um, I'm apparently hearing that uh, I need to speak louder. I'm <laughs> kind of at the at the max of my my local ability right here, but uh, uh, that was most of what I was going to cover. Um, I might might scan through and just see if another few things catch my eye. Um, let's see. There's one called hog peanut, and we that's one of the things that the, the name caught my uh, caught my attention. How can you not love something that says hog peanut? <laughs> And uh, it has a little trifoliate leaf, just like a bean, except it's much, generally much smaller, and it's a trailing vine. And it has a little bean. It looks like a tiny pinto bean, usually only like three to five to a capsule. Uh, the interesting part is that where the hog peanut part comes from is it's got a subterranean tuber, much like a peanut. It's got a little shell, sort of like a peanut, but, uh, but it's, it's not elongated, it's round. But uh, if you can find those that are producing, I bred a lot of them up to where they didn't have the peanuts. They didn't have the hog peanuts. Uh, but when you find them, you're, you're into them. And they, again, being in the Ozarks, the trick is finding them and growing, growing in loose enough dirt that you can actually get to them. Um, let's see here. Common hackberry is one of the trees that... Um, I've known about that tree since I started being in the woods. It, it has a tiny little about garden pea sized berry and uh, I'd heard they were edible but they've got a very thin rind of sweet flesh around a very hard round seed. So basically I was just picking them off the tree and chewing and sucking the sweet stuff off it and spitting it out. Then I came across an article or something written by Yule Gibbons who he was one of the first uh, authors of plant uh, foraging guides that I'd ever come across and uh, anyway he talked about making hackberry candy bars and that was the thing that got him into foraging. Turns out that that little nut on the inside uh, on the inside of that hard shell nut is a little piece of nut meat that is very oily and very sweet itself and that's where all the nutrition is. So he said somebody taught him to take the whole berry with the outer flesh and the, the thing and just pulverize it. So I used my uh, mokaheti, it's like a mortar and pestle type thing, and just pulverize the thing and it turns that, even with that, how dry that flesh is, it turns the whole mess into a uh, texture, something like stiff cookie dough. And it is very sweet, just like that. I mean, I was, I was pretty astounded. So uh, anyway, I made a batch of that and uh, he talked about adding some dried fruits, like, uh, you know, I, I used, I think, uh, cran raisins and dried cherries and raisins and a few things like that and some chopped up nuts. And then you just uh, roll them out real thin between wax paper and cut them up and you got candy bars. So I, I uh, let's see, I'll read the Hackberry fruits could be described as a nut fruit hybrid. They have thin skin of a sweet flesh covering a hard shelled seed. It has an oily and nut-like scent. They also persist on the tree into the winter, providing cold season foraging opportunities. So, uh, I'll show you a picture. That's the hackberry candy bars. And uh, the recipe is four to five hackberries, one tablespoon of honey or maple syrup, half cup of hickory nuts, hazelnuts, or whatever nut you have available, a half cup of dried fruit or berries, whatever you have available, finely chopped, Use a mortar, mortar and pestle or mokahedi to thoroughly pulverize the whole fruits. The fruit, flesh, and oily meat inside the seeds will give the mush a stiff cookie dough-like texture, and it's quite tasty at this stage. To make no-cooked candy bars, combine ingredients, mix well, roll out mixture between thin layer, or between layers of wax paper and plastic wrap. Note, the mixture will contain, will contain tiny seed hole fragments that are easily avoided by just not biting down too hard while chewing. If you got old bad teeth like mine you don't want to bite down on something hard but they're pretty minuscule and they're very easily avoidable 
but I included a weight to avoid that. Uh, <clears throat> to avoid the woody bits entirely, put the crushed fruits in a pan with a small bit of water and simmer while stirring to loosen up the flesh and soften the seeds. Pour this through a very fine strain of the cheesecloth to remove the hole. So it'll still be a little mushy at that point, but it's not it's not candy bar <laughs> consistency. So uh, it's a it's a pretty fun little thing. Um, this is a plant that I just become aware of. I'd, I'd known it was edible. I'd seen it in books for a long time, and had never come across it. And then when I learned it, it's, it's kind of everywhere. <laughs> it's all over the world now because of its edibility. Uh, it's uh, yellow nut sedge. It's a grass, it's a sedge that has a triangular stem, and it looks somewhat like that, if you can see it from that. And that's what the tiger nuts, they're, they're selling commercially as tiger nuts. Uh, it turns out that plant will produce more carbohydrates per acre than any other plant they've looked at. And they're looking into um, using that commercially in other countries for, because it will grow in saturated soils and uh, and other habitats where not you can't get a, a decent crop of other other carbohydrate like potatoes or anything like that. So I'll read a little bit about that one. Let's see. Um, the comments I'll, I'll read from that. Due to its aggressively colonizing nature, nut sedge is listed as an agricultural or horticultural pest in some areas. It, is widely, it was widely cultivated as food crop in ancient Egypt and most of Europe, and is being rediscovered today as an alternate healthy food source. Tiger nuts contain the type of starch that is a beneficial prebiotic fiber, helping burn fat and reduce hunger. Recent studies, show, or recent studies have found that its dietary resistant starch may improve insulin sensitivity and help reduce elevated blood sugar levels. Cyperus rotundus, which is purple nut sedge, is a similar sedge originally from India, but it has purple fly purplish flowers and less flavorful tubers. Some compare its flavor to menthol vapor rub, and, but it can be improved by soaking in water for several days then drying. And I got a uh, recipe from a lady called, uh, named uh, Wren Hafner. She's uh, Oh, I think in uh, east of, of where I live, I'm not sure the exact area, but she has a uh, business called Ozark Mountain Jewel. They are full on doing the uh, homesteading and uh, permaculture thing. They're building out of all natural materials, they're growing and raising things to sell, and it's just she's, she's on it. So check out that page, and they're doing wonderful things. And I'll leave the recipe for uh, Tiger Nut Horchata if you're. Uh, fan of Mexican uh, type food. A lot of times they even find the horchata. I fell in love with that stuff down in Mexico and now we're starting to see it here. So this is uh, Ian Giesbrecht is her partner in that, in that endeavor at um, uh, uh, was at Mountain Jewel and it was his recipe. So it's uh, one cup of tiger nuts, seven to eight cups of water, uh, three quarters of one teaspoon of dried ground cinnamon or dried spice bush berries, two to three tablespoons of honey, agave nectar or other sweetening, and a small splash of vanilla flavoring. Wash and scrub the tiger nuts thoroughly. Soak them overnight. Add water to a saucepan with the nuts and other ingredients. Bring to a low simmer for five minutes while stirring. Place all ingredients in a blender and blend until smooth. Pour the milk mixture out into a nut milk bag and, and or several layers of cheesecloth and squeeze all the milk out. Transfer milk to a large glass container and refrigerate until ready to drink. So, serve chilled, topped with nutmeg, allspice, or other summer spice. And that's a, that's a tasty little thing there. Um, I'm going to read one more. Is that what that do? And uh, this is one that is ready to harvest right now. And it's one of my favorite drinks. It's the sumac. And uh, we didn't see any on our plant walk that we did. Uh, well, actually, we did. We found one. It was a very out of place winged sumac that was the tallest one I've ever seen. So hopefully, you'll get to see that on the recorded plant walk version of this. Uh, sumac berries produce uh, something on their skin of the berry that is so high in sorbic acid that it's like a lemon. So you can just put your finger up and touch 
the berries when they're ripe, lick your finger and it's like you just stuck it in lemon juice. So they are ready to harvest right now. And that's the, uh, the common varieties are uh, smooth sumac and winged sumac and what's the other one? Staghorn sumac. And all those have bipinnate leaves, kind of like walnut. And they all have maroon uh, Christmas tree shaped clusters of really tight packed small berries. And that's the, when you get them when they're ripe, right about now, and you just get a big jar, fill about half full of the berries, fill the rest of full of hot water, leave it overnight while, you know, shaking and agitating it every now and then. And that will make something so sour, it's kind of like trying to drink lemon juice. Then you cut it if you need to, uh, and then sweeten it, your favorite sweetener, which is, I use a combination of stevia and uh, agave nectar. But sugar works fine too, it just makes a delicious lemonade. Well, I said earlier I'm a big fan of Mexican food, and I sure like having a margarita with my Mexican food. So I decided to put in a recipe for the adults, if you like this kind of thing, and it's a sumac and gooseberry margarita. And uh, I thought, well, with all that lemony sour stuff, I didn't have uh, limes at the time I needed to make one, but I sure had it by always collect the uh, the berries this time of year, the sumac, and at any given time, I've get, usually got gallon jars filled with sumac berries because I have to have it all winter. Uh, it's very good astringent on my throat. I cut uh, fire cider with that and sweeten my fire cider with uh, uh, honey and elderberry syrup. And that's my, it's called a drinking vinegar or a fruit truck drink. So that's one of the uses I use the, mar the uh, sumac for. Um, in addition, and I think we talked about it on the plant walk, is that uh, it makes a very good spice. Uh, it's called the za'atar. It's a Mediterranean spice used in, as a meat rub, or topping for salad or soups, a very useful plant. So I will read, to, uh, read the sumac uh, uh, margarita recipe, and I think that will wind up our presentation. Recipe for sumac and gooseberry margarita. One cup of sweetened sumac lemonade, one and a half ounces of tequila, one ounce of triple sec or other orange liqueur. Crushed gooseberries or other wild berries or fruits uh, can be added. Add an extra dash of agave nectar or stevia if using gooseberries because it makes it quite sour. Muddled fruits in a large glass, add other ingredients. Stir well and serve over ice and salt or sugar in a cocktail glass. Optional flavorings include wild fruit syrup such as prickly pear fruit, uh, or any species of sweet berry or even savory herbs. This drink pairs well with grilled prickly pear tacos. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, this is the book. It's Forging the Ozarks. I'm selling it through my website at firstearth.org. There's no space of punctuation, although it is. Uh, or you can get it on Amazon and some of the other big retailers if you want to make Jeff with Bezos Richard, which some of you might, and some of you probably won't. So, uh, anyway, I thank you for your time, and uh, you all need to come out and see this place. It's a wonderful, wonderful facility they have out here, and they're doing great things. And uh, so, you will be hearing more from them in the future. Thank you very much.